Hi everyone, it's Mystery Monday. I'm Sarah Altair and welcome to our weekly chat where we talk about mystery writing and I have Ask Me Anything questions. So today I had a couple of announcements before we get started on our topic for the day which is the detective in the victim's world. So I just wanted to let everyone know that um, my next novel, The Vellum Scribe, just went out to the advanced readers yesterday and I'm already getting feedback on that. And I do what they do. I always like to double check everything. So I went and downloaded, whoops, I'm going backwards. Um, I downloaded mine to my Kindle, which is my e-reader. Um, I'm so very excited about that. So it'll be coming out beginning of September. Also, for everyone who's following along, I have updated Bonnie Johnson's 40 sentences, particularly for mystery writers. And um, so you'll see Bonnie's original suggestions, which are so much fun. And then my um, additions for or that pertain specifically to mystery writing. So there's a link in the show notes for today if you'd like to see the whole thing, all 40 sentences um, as they pertain to writing a mystery. So today we're talking about the detective in the victim's world. So these of the 40 sentences, these are 16 through 20. And we're still in the first first part of Act 2 or the last part of Act 2 if you do if you're going for three act structure. I'm sorry, I'm not being clear today. <laughs> If you're in, you know, I think in three act structure, we're in the first, still in the first part of Act Two. If you think in four act structure, we're coming to the end of the second act. All right, I'm sorry. I hope that was a little clearer. So now we are, as you take your detective and your readers deeper into the story. Um, your detective is discovering a new world and it's the victim's world. So once again, I want to stress before you start in on all this and you work on your characters, be sure to spend a lot of time on your victim because they may be dead in your mystery, but um, everything that they did and the people and their relationships and their backstory all have implications for the detective when he enters the victim's world. And here we're at a point where the, your detective is in that world. He has enough evidence and clues um, to, to be in the world, but it's still a mystery to him. So he's wandering around in this world really without a map. And so you can stress all of your detectives wonderings you know just trying to decipher what this world is like um, and uh, he gathers bits and pieces of information and meets suspects and as he does so that environment expands and his vision of the vi victim's world expands so in this sequence of chapters, your detective searches and searches. That's pretty much what's going to be happening in these five chapters. It's going to be a lot of discovery and um, and at this point, your detective thinks she knows the victim's world, but discovers there's more than her first introduction. And um, with each discovery, your detective learns and goes deeper into that world 
and your reader and you're taking your reader into that world as well so they're getting they're getting a sense of what that world is like and and the population of that world and who those people are that interacted with the victim until your detective makes a discovery that turns everything around and so in this section you want to pay close attention to your story not that we don't always but um, this is this is often the place where uh, beginning writers start to bog down and their middle starts sagging and it's easy to lose readers at this point so um, avoid trying to rush the story to the end at this point you're getting your detective you're taking them deeper into the victim's world and getting your detective to that midpoint where he discovers something that gives him a new perspective on the victim's world okay so let's go through chapter by chapter so what Bonnie says is we just had a big, a big fall down in chapter 15. So here we are in chapter 16. Retreating, your protagonist finds temporary safe haven, but only at the cost of a sacrifice big enough to hurt. He kicks, he licks his wounds and he receives advice and his misbelief keeps him from understanding how to apply it correctly. So, as this applies to your detective, he this is often a point where he retreats to review what he knows so far, but he's not progressing. He just looks at each thing that he thinks he knows, and it's not making any sense. So he also may be licking his wounds from something his opponent did that kept him from moving forward or someone either a suspect a love interest or even the opponent tells him something but he overlooks that information it's a key point of information but he overlooks it at this time so in plot terms this is the aftermath of the first pinch point okay so chapter 17 your miserable protagonist reaches for one of his usual coping mechanisms and even if it's available in this strange world it doesn't give him relief he might hide it well from those around him but he's on the verge of a meltdown and desperate enough to try something new even if it means temporarily abandoning the misbelief that he's been hiding that he's been hiding behind okay that's Bonnie's suggestion and also, this is the point where you can put subplot A, another sequence from your subplot, your first subplot, in here. So let's take a look at our at this from a detective's perspective. Lost in the victim's world, your detective tries one of her tried and true methods. But no one in this world is responding. This world is the victim's world. She's so frustrated. She's a breath away from throwing in the towel. Desperate, she tries something she's never tried, and maybe it will work in the victim's world. Then, in walks the love interest, and things get open or even intimate. Things are mixing up in the plot world as you get to this third complication. Okay, so does that make sense? We've got the third complication. All right, chapter 18. This is Bonnie's suggestion. A new door opens up for your protagonist, but the price of walking through is steep and might include losing allies or sticking his neck out in a big way. And this is also where you can include a subplot and for our demonstration model um, with subplot B. So something unexpected happens and your detective is on it. 
but he's going to pay a price. His opponent keeps him from taking the next step and or a suspect shows him in spades that he doesn't understand the victim's world. This is definitely a place where um, your detective goes deeper into the victim's world and still doesn't quite understand it. So in plot language, you're in the aftermath of the third complication. Um, and then chapter 19, on the other side of the door, waits an ambush that your protagonist survives by improvising, surprising even himself. All right, that's Bonnie, Bonnie's suggestion. And as far as your detective is concerned, from out of left field, a surprise that spills the puzzle pieces. That's the best way I can explain it. It's just like everything. <laughs> and forced to improvise, he sees everything in a new light. Uh, in story structure, this is the setup for the midpoint. And now we're getting to chapter 20, which is the midpoint. And we'll have a little bit more to say about that after we look at uh, chapter 20. So Bonnie's suggestion, past the ambush, your protagonist makes a discovery or has an epiphany that allows him to see that he hasn't been playing the game wrong. He's been playing the wrong game. And more is at stake than he ever imagined. Man, is this a great place for a twist. <laughs> I, I, I love Bonnie's descriptions. All right, so for our detective, while your detective rearranges the puzzle pieces, he sees something new, has an epiphany that tells him he's been looking at the wrong details. It could be that the suspect who seemed like the right one reveals an alibi that puts them out of the picture. Whatever it is, he's still lost in the victim's world and realizes he's been looking at the wrong clues. So big awakening for the detective that he's really been going on a, on a wrong trail. So in plot structure, this is the midpoint. Okay, let's talk about the midpoint and the middle for a little. So the middle of your detective story is a pivot where your detective, uh, your detective goes from digging deeper and getting closer to the killer I'm sorry, from digging deeper to getting closer to the killer. This is a, it's pivot. And it goes from discovery to going on the trail. And he's learned enough to hunt for the killer with some idea of who that person could be. The middle chapter is high drama and pulls your reader into the story. And one way to focus this chapter is to make it either a mirror of the end or the opposite of the end. Um, and whether your detective has a complete fail or a win in this chapter, your detective suddenly sees the victim's world in a new way. And um, you can pull out some stops here. You don't have to save it all for the end, and you can make this very high drama in the middle. The middle is one of the most important sequences in your detective story. And spend some time honing every detail in this chapter while shining a light on your detective skills. However you've presented your detective skills from that opening sequence where he uses one of his skills to, you know, show your readers what your detective is like. Now is the time to really shine a light on his skills and let him or her work those skills to get to this new level. So he's been in a forest and can't see the forest for the trees. And now at the middle, he has a glimpse of the big picture. Okay, the forest. Okay, I hope that helps. And the middle is so important, and especially for beginning writers, um, this is a place where you can really focus a lot of your attention. 
um, because now you've given the reader a new hook. Okay, all right, so let's do some questions here. I've got the story, but I keep changing the title. Do you have any tips for narrowing it down? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I think, I think all authors, unless there's, you know, some lightning stroke and they've got the title and that's it, um, struggle with this because you're dealing with brand awareness, the brand being you, the author. You're dealing with a title that fits your genre and, um, and the title of your book. So, because a good title is key to getting readers to choose your book. It's like the book cover. It's one of those first things that people see. So you want it to grab their attention. And um, and you want it to reflect your genre. It's really an important marketing decision. I, I know it's hard to make that switch from writer to business person. But once your book is done, you are in business, you are an author, your author persona is your brand and your books are part of your brand and the titles reflect your brand. So it is a marketing decision as well as just the title of the book. So let's take a look at the features of a good title. Let's see, we've got, um, want to grab attention for sure. And make it easy to remember. And don't make it long, long and complicated. Just short and pithy and boom, you know. And also that it indicates is the genre or the theme of your book. And that it's easy to say. Nothing complicated. Because amazing as it may seem, if someone reads your book and they want to share that, that book with another person, Having a title that's easy to say makes it easy to remember and easy for them to share. Hey, I just read this book, great new book, and it's called, mm, and there they are with an easy to say, easy to remember title. So those are things to keep in mind about your title. And then doing a book title, coming up with a book title is really a brainstorming exercise. So it's like any brainstorming exercise. The first thing is you open up to any idea. You just write down as many titles and you just keep that list and keep it growing and growing. And, um, and with no judgment, even if it sounds weird to you at the moment and it's an idea for the title, write it down. Okay. Um, so you have this list of potential titles and keep adding to it. And once, once you have a sense of the titles that sell in your genre, go take a look at, you know, other books in your genre. In this case, we're talking about mysteries and detectives and crime. So go take a look at the titles, other titles that of successful authors and successful books and see what those titles are like. Um, and look, and then look at your brainstorming list and see which one of those titles that you've come up with kind of fit into that genre and mirror what uh, other successful book titles have. So um, think of words and phrases that capture the tone of your manuscript. Um, that'll help too. You can do a word list um, as an addition corollary to your title list and then kind of play around mixing up those words. And you can go through your manuscript and look for any pithy sayings. A lot of authors, mystery authors do this. They pull one phrase from the, from the story and that's the title of the book. So that's one way that people do it. Um, So I think I mentioned this, you can change the word order, add an action verb like kick, kill, kiss, you know, that's an action verb in your title. 
um, or an emotionally charged adjective like deadly, ravished, irresistible. Um, come up with some really highly charged words. Um, or you can look at your protagonist's role. Um, just, you know, the stumbling detective, the magistrate, whatever, whatever it is. Um, uh, that's an idea too. And uh, some very successful books have used the antagonist as the title. So Hannibal is a good example of that. And sometimes you can push it as far as location. Um, I'm thinking of the onion field. So, uh, make the list big and then narrow it down. And then, oh, one more, one more thing I just thought of is make sure your title isn't already used somewhere, um, especially if it's a popular title. So you want to check that. If that's something that's happening, you're just going to do some research and check it out. Uh, that'll keep you from being in competition from something that is already successful because you don't want your book getting lost in searches to an already popular book. Okay, I let's see if I can think of anything. I, I think that's it. That should help you get started. And of course, if you still have any other qu questions, feel free to get in touch. Okay, that was actually that was it for today's question. Um, so, so we're done. Always feel free to get in touch with me if you have any qu questions about your current mystery that you're writing or one that you were thinking about writing. I'm happy to help other authors as we share. Um, that's, I just think that's how the world operates best. So thanks everyone for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you'll get a reminder each week. Um, and if you're on YouTube, click the subscribe button and then don't forget to hit that little bell so you'll get a weekly notification. All right. So next week we'll be off past the middle. So join me then and thank you very much for being here today.